Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for attending this evening, this event today. Uh, my name is Sylvia Mangia Lenin, and I am the president of the BC Black Israel Awareness Society. Before we continue with our program today, I would like to make a land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and ceded territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, on whose traditional territories we operate, learn, work, and organize today. Um, for more than 25 years, the BC Black History Awareness Society has been bringing you events during Black History Month to educate about, honor, and celebrate the contributions, achievements, and struggles of Black Canadians in British Columbia. We believe that knowledge of history is important mechanism. It's an important mechanism to counteract racism and increase justice and equity for all. Our society has many projects in addition to Black History Month. We are working with the Ministry of Education to increase the presence of Black history in our schools. We finished a new online exhibit for the Digital Museum of Canada on the BC Black Pioneers. In August 2021, we opened an exhibit on Black history in BC at the Royal BC Museum that will be on until the end of March. So I hope that you can take your children and enjoy this wonderful, enlightening, and very, very well done exhibit. So these are some of the things that we are doing. And our website has maintained an extensive learning center uh, so, uh, that you can find at the bcblackhistory.ca. Um, this is our first event for this year, 2022 Black History Month. Black History Month started in, 20, in 1926 with an American historian named, his name was Carter G. Woodson. The annual commemoration was officially observed across Canada for the first time in February 1996, following legislation introduced by Jean Augustine, the first black woman elected as a member of parliament. Black History Month is not just a time to celebrate those from the past. It is also a time to consider how we will shape present and future history to create more justice, justice in our daily lives and institutions. The reality is that much of our history continues to be erased from and made invisible in the mainstream chronicles. While Black History Month cannot replace making knowledge of our history and culture relevant year around, the spotlight in February can serve as a catalyst to make sure that the contributions of people of African heritage to BC and Canada are acknowledged through the year. It is an excellent opportunity to reflect on where we are as a province and as a nation. Thank you for joining our Black History Month celebrations. And uh, now I want to welcome you and show you a video of our mayor. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Song and Nations. On behalf of the City of Victoria, it is my pleasure and really important to acknowledge February as Black History Month. During Black History Month, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by Black Canadians to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. The 2022 theme for Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness, inspired by the theme for the United Nations Decades of People of African Descent. The observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued battle against racism that we all need to fight and that Black Canadians and Black Victorians experience every day. At the City of Victoria, we are committed to in inspiring and creating diversity and inclusion and welcomeness and welcoming and belonging for everyone. It's important to all of us, Mayor and Council and our whole city, that the city feels like a safe place for all members of our community and during Black History Month, we make particular efforts to welcome and support Black Victorians. 
We are fortunate to have wonderful partners here at the city who support and inspire uh, awareness about black history, uh, in particular the BC uh, Black History Awareness Society. Uh, once again, thank you to the organizers uh, of this video and the or Events for Black History Month for your important work. And I'd now like to read a proclamation from Victoria City Council proclaiming February 2022 as Black History Month. Whereas during Black History Month, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by black Canadians to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development. And whereas Black History Month grew out of, out of the establishment in 1926 of Negro History Week by Carter G. Woodson and the Association of the Study of African American Life and History. And whereas the celebration of Black History Month was initiated in Canada by the Ontario Black History Society and introduced to Parliament in December 1995 by Jean Augustine, the first black woman elected as a member of Parliament in Canada. And whereas Black History Month was officially observed across Canada for the first time in February 1996. And whereas in 2022, the theme for Black History Month is Black, His Black Health and Wellness inspired by the United Nations International Decade of People of African Descent. And whereas the observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued need to battle racism and build a society that lives up to all of our democratic ideals. And whereas the city of Victoria is working towards becoming an inclusive community in which all of our citizens, past, present, and future, are respected and recognized for their contributions and potential contributions to our community, the province, the country, and the world. And whereas the city of Victoria is proud to honor the history, of, history and contributions of black Canadians in our community, throughout our province, and our nations. Now, I hear, hereby proclaim the month of February 2022 as Black History Month on the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking people, Songhees and Esquimalt Nations in the city of Victoria, capital city of the province of British Columbia. Thank you. That was our mayor wishing, you, wishing us a, a happy Black History Month. So now it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker for this evening. Dr. June Francis is the co-founder of the Co-Laboratorio Collab Advantage LDT, LTD, sorry, a special advisor to the president of Simon Fraser University on anti-racism, director of the Institution for Diaspora Research and Engagement, co-founder of the Black Caucus as SMU, and an associate professor in the BD School of Business. As a chair of the Hogan's Alley Society's Board of Directors, she also leads an organization whose mission is to advance the economic and cultural well-being of people of African descent through the delivery of housing, building spaces, and programming. She's an advocate for the equity, diversity, and inclusion for racialized groups as well as human rights. Through her research, consulting the media, and as a volunteer as well. June Francis extensive experience expand the private sector, public sector, national, regional, and local. As an entrepreneur with civil society on governance boards and, and as an academic. She served on SFU's board of governors and on the board of directors of Mosaic, a key immigrant and refugee settlement society, among other board services. She worked with governments, industries, and civil society to advance diversity and inclusion in governance and economic opportunities across a wide range of formal and informal sectors. Internationally, she has worked in China, the Caribbean, South America, and Europe to strengthen, and go and to strengthen governance and create inclusion for racialized minority groups. And it, it is my pleasure to leave you with her this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Francis. What a pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm presuming everything looks okay and that everybody's hearing me. I want to start um, by saying what a privilege it is for me 
to have been invited by the BC uh, Black History Awareness Society, a society that I hold in such high esteem for all the work that you do. So I wanna lift my hands to you and thank you. I come to you uh, from the traditional territory, the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam people. I also want to acknowledge and thank you, uh, all of you today, for thinking it important enough to join us on this webinar. Uh, I think uh, that is the most important uh, thing of all, that you have chosen to spend your time uh, to join us on this uh, important topic. As I speak to you today, what I'll be trying to do is cover quite a large uh, swath of thinking. I have been thinking about these ideas probably my whole life and certainly for most of my academic life. And so I'm hoping to cover a lot, uh, to get through a lot, and uh, hopefully I'll get through it. Um, the second thing is that I, I, will, I will start by situating myself a little bit, but I'm uh, introducing the history of, of racism in, in universities. And I will end uh, by going through the Scarborough Charter with time for us uh, to, to answer some questions that you might, might have. Um, my hope for this talk today is that we'll be galvanized to recognize the importance of this topic and to really put every effort we can to address in this important area of our society and our institutions. So I'd like you to bear with me as I share my screen uh, and, uh, and, and, and speak to this issue at this moment. So thank you very much. As you know, the talk today is about the history of anti-Black racism in Canadian universities and schools and the significance of the Scarborough Charter. To start with, I'd like to situate myself as I think it's important to, for people to understand both what I bring uh, to you today, my background, and also my blind spots. I am a stolen person. Uh, my ancestors were, of course, transferred across the, 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 the Middle Passage and survived for a very long time to deliver me to this moment uh, today. And I, I start by acknowledging them. Uh, and in particular, um, the, to, to acknowledge the savagery uh, that they experienced, but to also recognize the stolen lands that we were placed in. Uh, I am originally from Jamaica, which was the ancestral uh, home of the Taina First Nations people. They continue today only in the bloodlines of many of, our, of the people we refer to as the Maroons. I also want to acknowledge the work of Nanny of, Ma of the Maroons, a woman who has been a hero of mine, a heroine of mine, um, and who has uh, was one of the people who the British had to uh, make treaties with because of her incessant and in, in, in very effective strategy and untiring devotion to ensuring the, liber the liberation of her people. I am the seventh child of uh, parents who also was born into colonial Jamaica. My father was a journalist. You see him on the upper uh, corner of the screen. Uh, one trip that he made to, to London, uh, the colonial capital at the time. But for much of his life, he was... Uh, uh, associated with Marcus Garvey, knew Marcus Garvey. They uh, tried to start a paper together, and uh, he wor worked uh, as well in the um, a number of the underground and 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 uh, newspapers that were the voice that um, uh, that reflected much of the fight. Uh, against colonization. My mother, a deeply religious woman, saw to it that her daughters 
and all her children um, were educated. And I am eternally grateful for her because she saw that she always told us that she failed to get the education she desired. And she was determined that her children would. And I am that baby in the middle, uh, what the Jamaicans call the wash belly, uh, the wash belly, the last child. As you can tell, I, I emigrated to Canada, uh, but that's enough of me. I want to start by saying, why is Canadian Black? Why do we have Black History Month? Why is Black History whited out of Canadian history? A, a question that we are all asking, that has been asked so many times. And, and the point I'd like to make sure that we start with is to truly understand this wasn't that we for, the Canadians forgot us, which they did, or that we suddenly, um, the, the, you know, they, it just sort of happened by accident. We, we were intentionally erased from the history of this country in the same way that we have been erased from the history of the world in many areas, because it was an intentional part of the colonial strategy. This call for representation uh, of black history, you know, it crosses the country from Ontario to BC. But I want to also remind us that this has been going on for the 40 years I've lived in this province and that that fight preceded me. Uh, from the time that we were liberated and before, we know slaves fought for the right to be educated. So this fight is not a new one, but it continues. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the roots of white supremacy and anti-Black racism in uh, educational system, uh, systems. Afua Powell Cooper, Afua Cooper, who you see here, what a woman, what a visionary historian of epic proportions um, who, 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 who came to Canada from Jamaica, so one of my compatriots, and she said, uh, to understand how the legacy of slavery is expressed, we must comprehend the systems of power and oppression and the agency of white supremacy that slavery was premised on. Our history matters, but it also matters for us to understand that these forces are reflected today in our contemporary society. Colo the colonial educational logic, well, it was important to empower and to colonization that white supremacy be indoctrinated in our educational system to justify uh, uh, the system it had, and that anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism was intentionally there to support colonization. It was there to promote ideologies, to dispossess and uh, dispossess Indigenous communities globally, including in Canada, and to justify Black subjugation and slavery. The narrative that we all are, can recognize is a narrative that said that the civilized, advanced, enlightened, and innovation that we see around us was, con is, was always attributed to European sources. And so it's important to understand that if the society is racist, they were taught to be. Some of the great luminaries that are still being esteemed in universities across this country. People like Voltaire, who otherwise advocated uh, for freedom, uh, had very racist views because the Nick, he, Voltaire, right? Voltaire, the Negro race is a species of men as different from us as breeds of spaniels are from greyhounds. If their understanding is not of a different nature from ours, it is at least greatly inferior. 
Humes had something very similar to say that we were naturally inferior to whites. And he went on to, to, of course, obscure it by suggesting that we didn't have a history of brilliance and of science because this didn't happen again by accident. And we see this reflected in our educational system. We see it across the globe. It's deeply embedded in the very pillars of what we are taught, all of us, by the way, most of us have had a deeply colonial education. I know that as a Jamaican, I was essentially taught to hate myself. Because you see, other knowledge systems were erased or denigrated. Historical, intellectual, and the cultural contributions of Africa and the African diaspora were sidelined. And why am I using this picture? Because on the right hand, my right anyway, is what we call European modernism. But on the left hand, it was in fact based on appropriating ideas from the continent of Africa. And yet that art, even today, is called primitivism. primitivism. Our art is primitive, but the Europeans is modern. As Marcus Garvey remind us though, that this was an intentional act because you see, it was to leave us untethered because a people, as Marcus Garvey says, without knowledge of their past, their history, their origin, and their culture is like a tree without roots. And many of our young people feel that way today because of this educational system. We know that education, however, is a force to be reckon reckoned with, a critical force. As Mandela, Nelson Mandela said, Education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. But, at what, but we're reminded that in Canada, anti-Black racism was institutionalized in segregated schools and racist city policies. As Hogan's Society in our own province reminds us uh, of the Hogan's Alley story. The town of New Brunswick, the first mayor, Gabriel Ludlow, was a slave owner who implemented some of the most draconian anti-Black um, uh, policies. Queen's University, remember this name, Queen's, because I'll come back to it at the end. It's a school of medicine in 1918, banned Black students. Black students were attending the school and was only revoked in 2018. 18, although in the 60s, they started to accept black students again. Do not be confused. In Canada, segregation and exclusion of the bodies of black people were policies. The, the founder of McGill University as well, as we know, had slaves. And here is a history, I can't go through all of it in the interest of time, but to remind us that Black people protested this, to always remind us that we were, we were resisting this always. And it was Leonard Braithwaite, the first Canada's first Black MP, MPP, who moved the motion that ended segregation in Ontario and remind us that the last segregated schools closed in Nova Scotia in, I listen to this clearly, 1983, okay? This is not ancient, this is our history. And all of that was to create the myth of white superiority. And if you look at research and the ways we are, the, the, what we know and what we don't know, and, and what it would have been to me as a child growing up to, in Jamaica to understand that while Cadbury and the Sloan family was, was attributed with, with inventing chocolate, that in fact, chocolate, 
the milk chocolate, what came from his time observing slaves and indigenous people in Jamaica. We are with the dominance of Western ideals and values was not a, was not an accident. It was there to promote the supremacy, the belief that whites are superior to other races and to justify why they should have control over racialized peoples and their property. So there was an appropriation of other people's knowledge systems and ideas. And that's that appropriation of our scholars uh, carry on to today. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the greatest sociologists, had to leave their, his university. And yet, and yet much of his ideas were attributed, other people were, were attributed to them. It was attributed to the white uh, scholars. And only now are we reappropriating them to his intellectual tradition. We see this reflected today. So it's not just as history, as Sylvia pointed out, it's our contemporary reality. And in Vancouver, we just saw this happen. Where a racist video, a racist video was published that caused great harm to this young woman. The school board of Vancouver did not know how to respond or they did. But either way, it was a deeply harmful response. If it was intentional, well, then it was harmful. I suspect it's a lack of capacity that exists without Black teachers, without Black administrators to step in and to guide the process. I don't think people intentionally meant to harm this young woman. But the de facto, she was harmed by a system that did not protect her. I know the school board thinks they tried, but if you don't have the capacity in it to address this young woman, what you do is create harm for her. And in the end, Vancouver student, she settled the human rights complaint against the school board. We all know that it would have been better had it not happened, but her mother and her resisted. And I'm so proud of, what, of, of that resistance. I'm so proud of this young woman and her family and all those who supported her. We see stories, the growing, the, the, the fact that in Vancouver in 2019 was a school with a plaque behind the basketball court. Now think about that. Let's put a plaque of Cecil Rhodes, who we all know was the architect behind the apartheid system and who has been discredited in South Africa and globally. Oxford University toppling its statue. And yet in Vancouver, we thought it was a great idea to put a, a plaque of him to remind the students playing basketball many of whom are, were probably black students, that you know what? There's a white supremacist looking over your shoulder. And when students asked for this plaque, when the parents asked for the plaque to be removed, you, the fight with a, with a principal saying, I am in the middle. I really don't know who Celsius Rhodes is. I believe that she doesn't know. Of course, because it's black history. Why would she know? And the black bodies that had to fight, I'm saying here, calls to remove the name in Winnipeg is still ongoing. I'm not sure what's happened there, but this is an ongoing fight. I know that there have been calls in Victoria to, to change the names of schools. And, and let me just say, what's missing this behind these stories is the work and advocacy that still primarily rests on the black backs of the black community. But the stakes are high for us. They're high. Our kids, our children, the next generation is dependent on us to create the flourishing. 
so that we don't have this conversation. So this young man is not going to have this conversation sitting at a computer uh, 30 years from now. This study in the Peel region, because you know what? We don't have research because we've not invested in black research. We don't have race disaggregated data. So we actually don't know in our own schools in this province, most of what we need to know. But this study tells us what we think is happening, that we all know as parents is happening in fact. That this black student was, that black students are more than, not this one, I'm sorry. Black students are more than twice as likely to be suspended than other students. And they're suspended for things like wearing hoodies and hoop rings. And I suspect for wearing, they're here as black people. More than 40% of all students suspended in kin kindergarten, kindergarten to grade three in the Peel region of Ontario were black students. We destroy them when kindergarten. I should have said it makes up 7%. I have an ampersand there. That's a mistake. Black students are also streamed to fail. I know so many brilliant black colleagues I have. Their stories of growing up in Canada, being streamed into a uh, non-academic field. And when I meet them, they're some of the most brilliant people I know. We look at, we have to also recognize that there is what I call de facto segregation, which is the way in which we organize ourselves and our institution again, not by accident, because it's, it's deeply embedded in the privileging of white and wealthy lives and the ignoring of all others. So it's not a surprise that when you looked at gifted programs, for example, in the city that I live of Vancouver, you will see as you look towards the Western side of Vancouver, a high concentration of French immersion programs as an example. But you will also see the same thing in what we call gifted programs. I know there's a move to change that title uh, as well. But when you look in these special programs, they're definitely located for some groups and not others. This isn't the same thing we see in Ontario, where these art schools are nearly twice, uh, there's nearly twice as many white wealthy students as other students. And of course you can imagine what the curriculum looks like as well. I suspect it is ballet and not African dance that's being taught. The curriculum needs to stop teaching black inferiority. And this is done not only by exclusion, by who tells the story, but by how we tell a story. When I grew up, I thought Wilberforce, William Wilberforce was who ended slavery. That was the narrative I was taught. And what it did was make me feel so inferior that my own people did nothing. Sam Sharp, one of our national heroes, who as I got older was, 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 was called and was, was named as a national hero, led one of the major slave rebellions globally. And it was shortly after the slave rebellion that slavery globally in the British global uh, colony for the British was abolished. We want our own liberation. He was hung, many people like him did not survive. But this is a man of privilege. He could read, he was a, but he fought. The whites did not expect him to be this. They were totally surprised. They thought he had all the spoils, but he understood what he needed to do with that privilege to fight for our people. And when I look at these beautiful young children who are already growing up seeing this as their hero, hero it, it just makes my heart glow that we must have this for all our young people in Canada. Yet our heroes exist. 
The stories aren't told. We need to keep these stories coming. How many people have heard of Robert Sutherland? The same Queen University I talked to you about. This Jamaican born man who came to Canada, won 14 academic prizes, graduated in 1852. I want you to remember that date. Slavery was abolished when, right? Not 20 years later, this man is graduating. I'm telling you, people were waiting to be educated. Most were not given the opportunity and it's being denied to us to this day. He qualified in 1855 and was British North America's first known lawyer. But here's the thing, this man's endowment to Queen's University is why we have Queen's University today. Queen's University was on the precipice of financial ruin and it was his, it was his contribution that saved the, the university. How come we don't know this? We need to tell these stories from black perspective. This is uh, Joe Fortes who died a hundred years ago yesterday. Oh, and we had a celebration here in Vancouver, but I had some things to say about that because I, so much of the time, this story was not told from our perspective. What I said I see here is a white Vancouver, a white Vancouver patting itself on the back for being generous to a black man. As if he was some exception, that it was some exception that he was a capable man. I think his life is more representative of the ways in which black people, despite the odds against them at the time, found ways to contribute to society while carving out a life, however horrific, and isolating for themselves. We must amplify our own stories, both historical and contemporary. Like the Hogan's Alley displacement, but also the work of the black community to bring back the joy by opening our first uh, supportive housing, prioritizing black people, black uh, Vancouverites, but also um, the long-term vision to return the stewardship of the black community. In the interest of time, I will keep going. Um, I won't dwell on some of these, but I must say that let's be clear, all of us as black parents, as we have gathered together in different spaces. I've talked about the barriers, we, the exhausting processes that we have gone through as parents, where so much of our energies have been about resisting barriers, how our children, I know my own daughter, uh, ended up in one of these gifted programs, but, but in fact, her own teacher forgot that she existed. The low expectations that we had to fight we had to educate our children about black history on our own to allow them to retain their self dignity. Where one of my sons was told that his assignment on, on the black history uh, was not a Canadian topic and how, how much that ruined him, his, his sense of his belonging. It didn't ruin him, but it ruined his sense of belonging in many ways. That, and we have to shore it up back at home and remind him and push him out and say, we keep going because we come from people, my husband and I, who resist. Pushed into stereotypic sports and discouraged from others. He wasn't, one of my sons wasn't good enough for badminton some, for some reason because he needed to play basketball the ways in which they were not protected from racism when it happened and ended up push, pressuring kids to conform. It's exhausting for parents. But you know, like everything else, 
the reinvigoration of the movements by the black bodies that came out for Black Lives Matter protests globally has, has led to the movement for change. And I'd like, as we move towards this part of the, the, the conversation to talk about some of the ways in which um, we have seen change across the educational sector. So for universities, suddenly we see the top limb of racist foundations, at least symbolically. So we see Ryerson University uh, becoming X university until it can rename itself as it recognized the deep harm it did to indigenous people, who by the way, while today is Black History Month and I highlight much of the ways black individuals have been treated, make no mistake, this has also been the experience of our indigenous colleagues, brothers and sisters. Dalhousie apologizes for the racial, racist actions and views of its founders. Where New, the, the, the Ludlow Hall at the University of, of, of New Brunswick, remember the Ludlow man, remember him? He had a hall of, in named at the Faculty of Law. Oh yes. And we see steps taken, at least symbolically. In our own SFU, of course, us at SFU had to endure the fact that our, our team was named the Klansman. The Klansman. And the university insisted that it started with a C. And we wanted to know when we went to play in the United States and we told everybody that the Klansmen were coming, what exactly were we to feel? Pride? And only after the Black Lives Matter do we see some of the response. In 2019, at the university level, scholars got together, many of them Black, and that's why research matters. People like Carl James, Melinda Smith and others got together, not just Black, but racialized faculty and decided to do some research to address the equity and meritoc the, the equity and meritocracy myth. And that's why they call it um, the equity myth. And what they found was that visible minority professors are both underrepresented among the professorate, but they also earn less. And that situation has not improved. In fact, has gotten worse. And this is behind the fact that for at least decades, Canadian universities have been putting in, uh, claiming to put in place policies that they claim are promoting equity and diversity. We need to question the performativeness of these statements. And what they found, by the way, is that on average, racialized faculty published more articles and acquired more grants. And these are the measures of our success. There are some issues around other parts of the study, but this, these findings should lay bare and open up for us something that we need to really see, that racism rather than meritocracy is what is embedded in much of our institutions. If we look at the issue of black students representation and, 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 and black uh, people, uh, uh, scholar representation, what do we find? And I'm so sorry, I noticed that the left hand is cut off and I'll explain what that is because it, it's, uh, somehow it's cut off on the slide. But it is that uh, when you look at for the, the senior administration in universities, less than 1%, it's off the chart, literally, 0.8%, 0.8% are black, yet we're 3.5 and, and approximately we think we'll be 4.4% 4. of the population of Canada, less than 1% of senior administration are black. When we look at full-time full faculty, same thing, 1.9% versus three to 4%.
When we look at doctorate holders, something interesting starts to happen. Well, we're 3%. That cannot account for why they're only 1.9%. There are more doctorate holders than are getting jobs in universities. And when we look at graduate students, they're overrepresented. Our, 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 our people are going to university. An undergraduate student, they're not necessarily getting through and they're not necessarily succeeding in the educational system to be embedded there. I'm going to have to pick up some of the pace on this just because I want to make sure I leave uh, time for question. Um, doc, um, Dr. Nelson, Charmaine Nelson, um, pointed out in a study she did that 0.5% of McGill's faculty are back. And she's one of only 10 black professors among 1,700. Remember, this university was founded on slavery. Remember that because it's no accident. When we think about the hopes and aspirations and the defeat that we experience despite the enormous aspirations, when we look at the black population, the yellow, all of us should just really recommit ourselves to our young people. Because in fact, black aspirations exceed other aspirations. Would you like to obtain a university degree? Black students, 15 to 25, say yes by a higher margin than other students. But when they, you ask them if they think they're gonna get it, Look at the gap, it reverses, because they're already knowing the obstacles they face. And when you look at how that translates into the fortunes, the black, if you look at first generation uh, immigrants who come to Canada and are in the low income bracket, and then you look at them in the second generation and the third generation, what you see is they start out in 29% are in low income brackets. And even in the third generation, it hardly dips to 24. But what do you see of other racialized groups who come to the other, what we call visible minority groups? It goes from 25% when they arrive to 8%. They actually do better than the white population. So you have to disaggregate data. And when we talk about anti-Black racism being a particular form of racism, this is what it looks like. I will briefly go through this, um, my own journey. I won't dwell on it, but I, I just, you know, I have been in academics for a long time. And I just want, I just think it's important to be transparent so that, so that I don't appear to be somebody who was exempted or, or, or I was somehow uh, able to get through the system without all the, the hardships, because it's a very important that we tell our own stories. So as I entered Canada, the first thing I did was I went to York University to do my business at MBA. I must tell you, and this is not to brag, I, I graduated at the top of my class. I had first class honors. I was the kind of person in Jamaica that was expected to go to Oxford. I went to York University instead because this is where I immigrated. This was the opportunity available to me. And I tell you, I was coming out of the University of the West Indies where, you know, Walter Rodney was my hero, my father, Marcus Garvey, post-colonial. We thought Black Lives Matter, Black, the Black Power Movement was behind us. I thought I was coming to the multicultural Mecca of Canada. And what did I find? Whiteness and Eurocentrism in the university. I, I just won't go in. There were no African... There was no African intellectual tradition. I suddenly was dropped into a place despite all of the black intellectual knowledge that I had been exposed to in my home country, Jamaica. So I knew it existed. I, I came to a country where I was erased. I was also in a country where I was told you're when I was, um, uh, I won't go into it. It's a long story. But I'll just simply tell you this, the way in which the power operated to disempower me by saying to me, you're only a black girl from Jamaica. 
No one will believe you when I was challenged. I will say, I did not, I did not end that fight and succeeded in the end. But I had to fight. I was a young woman. I did not need that fight. Entering the workforce the same way, I had to erase my identity to become acceptable, to become an acceptable uh, Canadian. I think of all the ways in which we create barriers in recruitment, training, and the support. And I'll remember, I put the, uh, Michelle Obama's uh, picture here because of something she said. Michelle Obama went to Princeton and she always said, the reason I went to Princeton was because <laughs> University of Chicago where I lived looked like a place I didn't belong. And the only reason I thought I belonged in university was my brother who was recruited on a basketball scholarship, went to Princeton. And I thought, oh, Princeton is a place where black people go. And she talked about the ways in which black support does not exist to aspire to the very highest level. On my own experience, a lack of black faculty, I was told that I would not succeed if I did research on, on black experience. Uh, that, that I had better get a respectable, but I will recount my experience at UBC. I went to UBC because I wanted to do a PhD. My husband, who is now my husband, was living here. I lived in Vancouver. I, was, I had my, a job here and I, I went to UBC. And the person who met me started asking me if I understood how hard the PhD was and that people like me should be thinking about other faculties than the business faculty, because it's really hard to get in. And I slowly recognized people like me meant black people like me. I went on to get my PhD from the University of Washington. And I tell that story because it was, I loved my experience there, but I must say the hardship, I was erased from my own country in order to get a PhD. I wanna also say, and I, I don't want to traumatize anybody with these uh, images. They're deeply traumatic to me. But I entered a field of marketing and realized my own education did not address the ways in which advertising promoted racism as part of the foundation of the very discipline I was part of. I had to do this work myself. I collected this work myself because I wanted my students to understand that when you see racism in advertising, it's because it was foundational to its intellectual origin. And if you look at this picture, think about science, the way black people were excluded and used as, 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 um, as guinea pigs. You think about AI, you think about the ways in which we're, we're, racism is baked into artificial intelligence. If you think about engineering, if you think about, you just have to think globally to recognize the arts, the enlightenment, performance, the school of contemporary arts across this country and the fight to get black performance arts in them. It's because of deeply racist roots are underpin much of the intellectual tradition. We must research these things and we must be honest and we must teach them. So this Carberry Charter, as I come to the end, I'd like to um, at least uh, uh, talk to you about what, what, what I think is a hope, uh, uh, an opportunity. And as the Black Lives Matter um, pervaded the, uh, the country and the world, um, we, the, the, the university black professors suddenly looked at each other and said to each other, we're all having the same experience. We all feel isolated. We all haven't been able to do the research to ensure that we can train the teachers of tomorrow. How do we expect teachers in the system to be able to teach our kids if there's no research, if they, we haven't taught those people to teach? So there's a ripple effect from universities. We haven't thrived in these academies. And this, I love this student at Queens she's, who said, 
why privilege permeates the walls, the books, the classroom, and everything that makes Queens what it is. And so we got together over the course of many discussions, and I wasn't one of them, but many of my colleagues devoted themselves to um, to act. I, I acted as, a, as, a, as an advisor, Simon Fraser University, I'll just shout out those students they sent in, but students across this province um, sent in their contributions. And this is the, 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 the opening of the charter. These, were the, these are the people who were the original signatories. And I wanna call out uh, Santuano and Joy because they're in British Columbia, the University of Victoria, not yet, not at the signature, I don't think here, but is thinking of it a lot or, or has done it. I'm not sure where it's at, but I'd say every, it, this relates to every college, every university, every tertiary institution, uh, should be signing up to the Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion. Because what it's calling for is that it's calling for Black flourishing. And let me remind you, it's part of a wider movement because everything builds on each other. Remember in 2014, the launch of the International Decade of People of African Descent? We still are working to realize it in Canada and to really have the action plan that we should have started. It ends in 2024, but hopefully this is a beginning of, of change. We also must remember it comes on the heels and, and the charter respects the historic significance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because this, we, this, is, this fight is the same fight. And we support, acknowledge, and give primacy in many ways to, the to the, our indigenous people on whose lands we're on. And it also comes as part of the permanent forum, the establishment of a permanent forum of people of African descent in Canada. And it, and it calls on universities and colleges to commit uh, to promoting intersectional black flourishing. It calls on, on universities to ensure they have race data. We don't even know how many black students are thriving. How many are there? What's their experience? What about university administrators? What about faculty? What about the staff? What about ha what happens to our black students in the, in the, in the wider world? What happens 20 years from now? We don't know because we don't collect data because we don't collect, we're colorblind society. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I also wanted to say, we're talking to representation because for many of us in universities, that's what we feel like. We feel so alone and separate. We feel like we're the only one in every space we go in. And so to, it calls on support for Black caucuses and Black student organizations. It also recognizes that research matters. And it calls on universities to have an action plan to support Black research, Black-led and Black subject matter research. But, you know, a lot of granting of research come from federal granting agencies. So it's calling on them to, to support and change the way grants are given because we know racism exists with the Social Science Research Council, the, the Canadian Institute for Health Research, you name it. Where do we don't get the grants, even though we get more than anybody else, but often we're excluded, we get, meaning we overperform on what we do, but that's because we get a lot of turn downs, I can tell you. Black faculty need to also go through the ranks. And that I'll, I'll tell you, the failure, just like me to go through the ranks, I am an associate professor, I'm not a full professor. All my work should be that. But why am I not a full professor? Because of all the other things I had to take the burden on of. I had to be on the Senate. I had to be on the Board of Governors. I had to be in the community. I had to, I didn't even have time to put a plan together to get my full professor because there was so much our students need us. 
And we find ourselves, and this is not excuse making, it's just saying some of the burdens that fall on our black, the few black people often results in sometimes are not focusing while our white colleagues and our other colleagues are able to focus on their own careers. We saw the, the failure in, in terms of COVID-19 because research matters. Let me just say this again, because research and data are evaluation and a barometer of which lives are valued and which are devalued. Academic research is underinvested. And so when it came to COVID-19, we had no data. We could not help. We, we, we didn't have the wherewithal to convince Black people in this country to trust things like the vaccine. Because their, their, their experience of this research has always been either they were excluded or harmed. Students and teaching, we have to make sure that we provide them with spaces and where they are not excluded. This is one of the things I heard over and over from students. We don't feel comfortable. We don't feel we belong, whether it's in the classroom or in the cafeteria, because nothing about these places talk to us. It doesn't look like us. Nothing in the curriculum is being shared. And we don't have Black professors. And we don't have Black books. And we don't have spaces that, that, that says to the world, we belong here, and we matter, and our history is to be celebrated. We need to support their leadership, what, how, and who is in the curriculum and in student life, financial scholarships across the board, the entire system, the number of student, Black African students who said they tried to make jollof rice and it was horrible. It was just not us. And it just feels like we just don't belong. Which sports do they play? Which sports do they not play? And in community engagement, connecting the town, as they say, with the gown. How do we reach out to our communities? And I know at the Institute for, um, the Institute for the, um, Research and uh, Engagement, uh, Diaspora Research and Engagement, my own institute, I'm just trying to go so long. We have refocused our efforts over the last years in focusing on engagement with the black community. And we have a proposal before Simon Fraser to turn the, to rename this institute into the Institute of Black and African Diaspora. And I ask for your support. Black resistance in education is an opportunity. Let's remember that. We need to resist, whether it's hiring black faculty and students, because we, these are our future leaders and we must commit to them. We have seen black resistance and the labor in the work of the BC Black Awareness Society. I, I say go to their websites, um, a lot of resources. This is an, an organization that has been here for a long time supporting black people. Uh, there is a there's an exhibit at, uh, that they supported, uh, which is now at the Royal BC Museum. Black people, black led at the Royal BC Museum, and we have a, still have a long way to go. Remember, these things are commitments. How do we sustain the pressure? I'm not trying to defeat anybody, but until we get to that mountain top. We're not there. And sometimes you're climbing a mountain and I always say we need to go up, but the, the incline matters. We need to go up a steep hill because we have a long way to go and a, a short time to get there. Let's make this as steep an incline as we can. We must go on and build on the work and remember the work that has been going on for decades in this province. I know every time somebody comes up with a great idea, they think it's new. Let me tell you, I'm getting to that age where I know how, how many people have tried and got exhausted by the process, but others have been there to take the mantle. 
Things are happening. SFU passed the motion to hire at least 15 faculty. And I love students. This was led by our students. They were bold, they were brave and uncompromising. And our black students led by other students. This was not just a black student, although it was led by the black students. The other students came around and said, this is not just about the black students. I have been robbed of the right to know the black history and contributions of black scholarship and intellectual traditions. One, one young man said, I have been here and I've never been taught by a black faculty. I feel robbed. We know things are going on. Hogan's Alley is involved with research. I'm also hauling out to the Ontario Black Health Mathers, who has put together a coalition at the University of Toronto. Uh, we have, uh, Hogan's Alley has been, if you haven't finished, filled out our research here, please do, on, on Black hesitancy being led by Gina O'Gilvie and Stephanie Allen from Hogan's Alley, uh, and, and Mona Pei, who is a research assistant and others. We also know there is an Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery that's being led by a number of black scholars, including uh, uh, the scholar that I, Nelson, Dr. Nelson, that I talked to you earlier. I will stop there and hope we have time to have a fruitful discussion. Let me, um, let me stop sharing my screen here and thank you for your attention. And again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for such, such an inspirational, such an encouraging conversation that you just have with all of us. And I'm sure as I was listening to you, many of us, many of our attendees were also seeing through your words themselves, through your experience, in this uh, educational system, because my, I myself, I experience some of the things that you were talking about. And uh, so I want to open a discussion for our attendees, if they would like to ask you any questions. And, uh, but I, I would like to start us off um, and ask you, Anna, uh, ask you a question. As, as, as black parents that we have our children, in our schools, how can we better encourage our children to stay, to not give up, to start seeing themselves in these schools? Thank you for that question, a question that plagued me for the entire time and continues to plague me as I'm a grandmother, but also because I see children across, I spent, you know, I love children. I love young people. Um, it's, it's, it's who I live for. And the burden on parents are extraordinary. But I do think there's some things, I wish I could tell you it's gonna be easy. But I, some things that I thought were important for me. One is to take the time to share your stories with your children. Many of us, many of us are so busy trying to get our, our kids to integrate, to be part of the bigger community, that they don't even know our own stories, our own history, our own pride of place. And I know that for my children, it was a source of continuing joy because I told them the same stories until they were exhausted, until they could repeat them of my history what my parents stand, stood for, but also what my what black people did to bring us to this place. So I really encourage us as a start to make sure in the home, you are living and modeling our, our, the, the, the reason why black people matter. But I'm telling you, that's not enough. I remember the day my daughter, we thought we were doing okay. And then my daughter came home with blonde hair on her, on her picture. And she said, because blonde people are pretty. And my husband who is white was even more and more, I mean, I was just used to knowing that this happens. My husband was like, he was about to walk over to the school. And I said, come back here. This is gonna be a long journey. 
And I remember the feeling of sinking because I realized that no matter what I do in my home, what happened outside is going to matter. And so we had to be absolutely vigilant at school. I am telling you, positively labeling your own children. What do I mean by that? I met the teacher and I reminded the teacher before they had a chance that my child was brilliant. I said, my children are brilliant in these ways. And I expect you to encourage and nurture that brilliance. And I'll be looking to see your plan for their brilliance. Because my children were sometimes forgotten. Their brilliance, they were presumed to not be in the classroom. So be vigilant, be at school. You need to also look at all the other places of support, form communities of strength. I had a black book club and we formed together as parents of mutual support. So I'm gonna stop there. Agitate for black books. Black books need to be in schools. They need to be read by the teachers. We need all of our heroes to be in the school and represented 12 months of the year and continue to insist that black studies be embedded in every subject, not just some subject called black history. Do there's a science that includes the history of black contributions in there? Is it in every piece of the curriculum? So I'll stop there and take them Take them back to your home country if you're from, or to Nova Scotia, or to your community in Toronto. Get them to know the people uh, that are forming parts of our community. Yes, that is, thank you so much for that answer. That is very important. If you can, yeah, take them back. Take them back to not your roots, where they come from, where you are their parents. They, they come. I think that is very important for, for the children as well as for their parents. Because once they come from those places, also that opens their mind and their eyes. And then when they compare it, where, where they are is so much enrichment to themselves and as to their with their colleagues as well. You know how they share with their classmates and, and with their teachers, you know. So yeah, thank you so much for this uh, answer. Uh, so I'm, I'm just looking if we have here uh, questions from the audience, from the audiences. Uh, one of the person asked, how can they uh, donate uh, money to, to the SFU, I, I believe, uh, work that you're doing? Oh, I love that. Yes. So send me an email. Francis at sfu.ca and I'll make it happen. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that happens. Because sometimes if I send you to a website, it doesn't work. And I don't care if it's $5 or $5 million. I, I'm so glad to hear that because it takes money. And we want you to agitate in your spaces. Uh, to, if people are going to, if you work for people or you're working in environments and there is a country, encourage them to, to put money against the cause. Thank you. Yes. Um, also, um, people were commenting to your presentation, and I would love to read some of their comments to you. Uh, it says, thank you, Dr. Francis. It's always great to hear you and learn so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such an enlightening um, presentation, Dr. Francis. Outstanding session. And we learn so much. Uh, as, anyway, there's so many. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fran thank you, Dr. Francis, SFU lower staff member. And I have much from you, and I have learned so much from your presentation. To take back to the spaces I am in, to continue pushing for advocacy and and words of action. Thank you. I am gratefully to be learning about Black history in BC and Canada. However, I am embarrassed by the ignorance. Yeah, I, I, can you say something about this ignorant thing? Uh, <laughs> that is something that, um, I mean, just the fact that this person was here today watching this uh, presentation, I think it's a big step, right, Dr. Francis, to end this uh, type of ignorance that she's talking about. And it's such a dishonor to Canadian people. It really is not just a dishonor to the black population, but it's a dishonor to all in like, people who well-thinking Canadians 
who also walk around being ignorant uh, of this, of all these issues. And, may, and it does make it um, so that they are not performing in their spaces as well as they could as individuals. So yes, I think this is, this, this is so let me make comment on something here. I do not think this, what I call white uh, ignorance is, or, or, or in a sense is an accident, right? As you can tell from my talk, I think it's part of the way in which power operates. You see, to keep people thinking that meritocracy and, and all of that is why they've achieved is part of the system of power. Once people start to understand the contributions and, and that, that much of the ground they're standing on is because of the wealth. And let me use that word. Somebody once asked me, what's the biggest contribution to North America, Black people? And I said, to the wealth you have. You are rich because of our labor that was not paid for. And because we brought to this country, this, pro this uh, continent, our expertise in growing rice, in a variety of other things. And we contributed it to you for free. And we didn't get anything, but you got land gra grants. So this ignorance is part of the system of oppression and power. And I think that's why we have to ensure that the history of Canada is told again in its, in its accuracy and its uh, complete authenticity. And in that history, we will start to understand what, that it's not the pioneers who built this province, this country, sorry, but it was the sweat of Black people on which this continent was based. It will remind us that black people came to British Columbia. It will remind us that they, they that, that, that it, had it not been for uh, the, the exclusion at the border that eliminated black people from coming north, many more people would have been coming here. We have to remember that we tried to keep black people from coming into this country. And we, so I'm going to stop. Because I'll keep going. But I just want to say that this ignorance is part of the power structure. And so dismantling uh, the power and privilege starts with dismantling a knowledge structure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I see some uh, questions here as well. Um, um, say, how do you, how do we, no, so how do you unite the various black communities in our province to fight the white supremacy, discrimination, and anti-black racism that we face in common? Thank you for that question. What a beautiful question. That is our power. That's where our power will come from. We will live and succeed or fail based on this one point. If we can unite, we will triumph. If we fail to unite, we will give in to the very intent of white supremacy because white supremacy taught us to divide and conquer. See, because the whole idea is that we have been put in a position of thinking that if the Jamaicans win, then it may mean that the Nigerians lose. That if the French Africans succeed, then the British Af Africans are forgotten. Because you know what? They're, we're being given crumbs. We're being given these small little things to fight over. And white supremacy created this world in which we, we perceive scarcity. So what happened is that we perceive whether it's recognition or it's power or it's privilege or it's time, we see that as scarce for us. And so we feel that, well, we have been forgotten. Maybe we need to act with curiosity because remember, we have not been educated to work with each other. We were educated as colonists, by the colonists to not regard each other. So the Caribbean people, when I grew up, I had to say I wasn't African or, or somebody knocked my head and say, why do you think you're African? And then the Africans thought, well, we were never enslaved. But this is white supremacy, okay? 
We are the same people, come from the same womb. We have so much in common. We should love and support each other's history. There's nothing I take more joy on than looking in Benin. And if I would show you, and all of us in the diaspora, by the way, our roots are, it's in our very DNA. And our African brothers and sisters, yes, we were the ones that felt the brunt of this. But you need to stand with us and not aside from us. Not, to, you know, we need to stand together. We're one in this country and that's how we're going to make it. And that's, we're going to flourish and have all our histories represented and all our cultures and we'll enjoy each other's food. And we'll suddenly realize the stupies in Jamaica is because of the red, red in Ghana. You know what I mean? And, and, and then we start to see our commonality and the joy we bring and we drum together, dance together and laugh together. Yes. Thank you so much. There is another question. There's many more, but uh, I think I'm going to ask you two more questions just for the sake of time. Uh, so this question here says, are there any people you would suggest we connect with to support the Scarborough Charter and the remaining of the Institute? But so I am, yeah. I am right at the, this moment. The... the um, uh, a special advisor to the president of the SFU, uh, to Simon Fraser University, and I am also on the Black North Initiative. So I'm a good contact, but we have a bunch of, con you can contact SOCA, which is a student organization at SFU. There are Black professors in UVic. Uh, uh, I think if you reach out, um, and if you reach out to me, I will connect you to whoem whomever is closest um, to, to the question you have um but but so so probably the easiest thing is connect with me and i will reconnect you but i'm so glad you're interested in being connected okay thank you and we are going to go to our last question here it says i am a racialized staff member at sfu and would like also i would like to know how to better connect with advocates as sfu as I keep hitting performative words, silencing and power barriers from those in positions of power. So you join the Black Caucus. <laughs> Why? Because that's exactly what we're there for. Uh, there are not many of us. Yeah, the Black Caucus is, a, is, a, is for students, alumni, um, faculty, staff. Okay, so that's everybody. Okay, so if you were an alumnus of SFU, if you were a current staff member of SFU, you can join our caucus and reach out to us. Again, since my email is the quickest, and we will connect you and we will bring you into the fold and provide the kind of support because that's what this whole thing is about. All right, well, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Dr. June Francis for being here with us this evening and for your wise words and for your encouraging and inspiring presentation. In the name of the BC Black History Awareness Society, our board, our um, uh, members, I want to thank you uh, very much for, for this time this evening with us. Thank you. And thank you all the attendees for being here today. We have many more events happening this month uh, please go to our website, bcblackhistory.ca, and in our website, you will find all the events that we have for this month. Thank you again, and uh, have you all a good evening. Thank you so very much as well, and thank you to the audience for being here. Have a great day. <laughs>